Everybody, Andy White here, and what you are about to hear is the fusion of heart, mind, and soul. And welcome, everybody, from all across the fruited plain and all around the spherical globe. Thanks for tuning in to this week's brand new edition of Open Up the Doors, a brand new excursion into the fusion of heart, mind, and soul. Hey, do me a favor. If, uh, if you'd like to, if you're able to, go on over to the Open Up the Doors Facebook page. Over there, I am. Uh, broadcasting live on Facebook Live over at facebook.com slash faithfm91.7. If you've never liked my Open Up the Doors Facebook page, please like the page. And for those of you who are on Facebook, join in the conversation. Please shoot me some comments, some insights, some, uh, you know, just let's get a conversation going, both on air, off air. And for those of you who are who are uh, in the chat room over there on Facebook Live, let me know where you are. Uh, watching from, listening from. We are uh, streaming live over the internet, of course, over at the HamptonsChristian.com website if you're outside of the broadcast area. But if you are outside of the broadcast area and you're not sitting in an office by a laptop or a desktop, let me tell you, the best way for you to listen to Faith FM 24-7 is to download the free app. If you go on over to HamptonsChristian.com, you can get the free app both for the Android platform and for your Apple platform. The links are there. For those of you on Facebook, uh, I I do believe uh, Debbie put the link up for the for the uh, face the Faith FM the free app. It's great to have on your iPad or on your iPhone. You can listen to, like I said, uh, Christian programming from the East End of Long Island twenty four seven. If you would like to correspond with me. You can email me at ajwhite777 at iCloud.com. It's ajwhite777 at iCloud.com. And, okay, folks, I think that gets my preliminaries out of the way. There is so much to talk about today. Of course, so much has gone out. Man, we are into 2020. It's only the ninth day in. And like I was telling you at the at the turn of the century, no, at the turn of the decade, I was telling you how, this was going to be an incredible year, an incredible decade, and it's already off to a smashing start. <laughs> no pun intended. But, of course, the big news of the week has been the Iranian uh, situation and the escalation of the Iranian situation and, and possibly the de-escalation, but with that remains to be seen. But uh, yesterday, President Trump, of course, many of you have probably saw that, uh, yesterday President Trump uh, d- addressed the nation and the main takeaway from what he said, he had, he had a lot of good things to say yesterday, actually, in that, uh, in that address to the nation that he did. But he said yesterday that Iran appears to be standing down following their attacks on two U.S. bases in Iraq on Tuesday night. So President Trump right now is declaring victory, at least for now, and rightfully so, by the way. He is declaring victory in the aftermath of the flare-up of the tensions between the United States and Iran. Things seem to be, for the moment, simmering down. But let the emphasis, my friends, be on for the moment. And to be sure, I am thankful for that, but I don't expect it to last very long, honestly. But however, 
Having said that, wisdom dictates that we should be vigilant and be prepared and simply wait all of this out with sober-mindedness, being alert. I like something that uh, yesterday in, in my, in my uh, Facebook feed, I got a, t- uh, there was uh, Joel Richardson, you know, the end times teacher and author, Joel Richardson sent out a tweet yesterday that I really chuckled about because it was really true and I really liked it. And Joel on his tweet yesterday say, I want to say yesterday regarding this whole situation, he, Joel said this, he said, you can be short of three things. There are three universal realities joel said yesterday in his tweet three universal realities number one you can be assured that whenever tensions rise in the middle east 95 percent of the people overreact and imagine that the apocalypse is here number two the apocalypse is not here yet 100 percent. and number three you can be assured that eventually it will come 100 percent Yes, folks, labor pains are like that. And though I myself am also concerned about overplaying something, and I certainly do not want, I I certainly do want, I said I don't want, I do want to reround the tape. I certainly do want to avoid and refrain from engaging in fear-mongering. And there's so much that can happen when these situations arise. Yet I'll say it again, I do think we need to be very sober-minded and understand how these apocalyptic Islamists really think and not be dismissive of it. As I've been thinking about the events of the last several weeks, it really comes down to this, really, folks. We've got to be careful not to overplay some things. But on the other hand, we've got to be careful not to underplay them either. We need to look at the situation soberly and with a preparedness of what could happen. Because the bottom line is this. You're not dealing with a rational worldview when you're talking about the Ayatollahs over there in Iran. You're dealing with an irrational worldview when dealing with Shia Islamists. It is, of course, uh, I'm going to get on a soapbox with this one. But it is needless to say that the mainstream lame brain media is not accurately conveying the seriousness of the situation to the American people. But having said that, again, well, they they can be, they they are talking about the seriousness of the situation, but again, the operative word there is accurately. But then when I think about that, I think to myself, how could they be? Because they really, really do seem to be utterly clueless as to the nature of the Islamic ideology of the ruling ayatollahs in Iran, or of Islam as a whole. You you turn on the TV, and all you see is this endless, endless pontificating and bloviating and endless speculation going on from people who know very little about what they're talking about when it comes to the Islamic jihadist mindset. And I'm really referring mainly to the, uh, the the leftist mainstream media because they don't want to touch that they don't want they don't want they don't want to broach that subject with a 10 foot pole but they really seem to be clueless concerning the ap- the apocalyptic mindset of the mullahs and their shia beliefs in iran and i i, I couldn't believe how many pundits i heard this week on the various news channels A lot of these pundits in the media seem to be convinced that Iran doesn't want a war any more than we do. But folks, I'm not so sure about that. Maybe they do. In fact, I'd be willing to bet they really do want a war. Because, again, here's the key that you need to take away. Iran's leaders are a bunch of apocalyptic ideologues that believe that a massive war will usher in the return of the Mahdi. And many of them, if not all of them, are convinced that the time for the Mahdi is to be now, that his coming is very near. And of course we believe that in our faith with Jesus Christ. But as this broadcast progresses, I'm going to show you the differences between the truth and between the counterfeit. Iran's supreme leader, 
Ayatollah Ali Khamenei. He's known as a Twelver. And so are m- most of the other top officials in the Iranian government. Most of us in the Western world cannot even begin to comprehend how they see the world, my friends. And with the removal of Soleimani, the new commander of the IRGC Cuts Force, his name, by the way, uh, Soleimani's uh, replacement, his name is, uh, he was a brigadier general, Ashmil Ghani. And he said Iran is planning to strike back at the U.S. and and ultimately its presence from the Middle East. So you see, things have been simmered down a little bit, but they're not finished because they have a game plan that they want to continue with. But to quote from Eshmiel Ghani, Soleimani's replacement, quote, we promise to continue Martyr Soleimani's path with the same strength and his martyrdom will be reciprocated in several steps, underline that, in several steps by removing the U.S. from the region. But Ghani went on to say, and this is really what's more salient for my point today, Ghani said this the other day, quote, the continuance of this movement, the Iranian uh, pushing into the Mideast as they are, the continuance of this movement is to reach the global governance of Iman Mahdi. May God hasten his reappearance. This important goal will be attained under the supreme leader. Maybe I should repeat what he just said here the other day. The continuance of this movement is to reach the global governance of the Imam Mahdi. This is their goal, folks. This is the stated goal of all the Islamic leaders, especially the Ayatollahs in Iran. But it's the goal of Erdogan of Turkey as well. And just as a side note, but it's completely relevant to the key issue today. And I really want to focus today on, on Iran, and I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about, about, about the Mahdi in a little bit, about the chaos that they want to bring about. But I've got to bring in some, some of the other uh, seasonings and spices into the salt because this all happened within the last several weeks, and, it, and it's totally, totally connected. But just this past week, Turkey has sent troops into Libya. And Turkey, back in uh, November, signed a military cooperation deal with Libya. Now remember, again, just by way of reminder, Persia, Iran, Turkey, Libya, they're all part of the Ezekiel 38-39 confederacy. So that's what makes this so important. But just last week, this uh, not last week, but back in November, they signed this military cooperation deal with Libya. And part of that uh, included this, this a military contractor uh, called, uh, the name of the contractor uh, is Sadat. It's a, it's a Turkish defense contractor and consulting firm. But the owner of this Sadat military contractor, here's where it gets really juicy, the, the uh the, the founder, the owner of this military contract, the Sadat, it's owned and run by, a, by the former Turkish Brigadier General Adnan Tanaverdi. Now, this guy Tanaverdi is also, imagine that, he's also the chief security advisor to Erdogan. Tanaverdi has spent most of his career in the Turkish Army Special War Department. So get this, this guy Tanner Verdi made headlines last month, well, in Turkey, in the Mideast anyway, because back in the uh, end of December, and they do this every year, they have, they have, they have a, a, a convention for the, they have a convention, they have a summit for the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, the OIC, an organization I've talked about many times on this broadcast. But last month, during that convocation or convention, whatever word you want to use, this guy, Tan- Tanaverdi, said that his company was paving the way for the arrival of the Mahdi. He also said in his speech to the OIC that the Islamic world would become united under the leadership of the Mahdi. This is all coming together, folks. 
See, they have a game plan. But wait, wait, wait. There's more that happened this past week. Just this past week, Turkey and Iran have agreed to strengthen their religious ties in a new deal signed last week in Ankara between the religious authorities of both countries. The new initiative led by uh, some Iranian guy's name who I can't pronounce. Looks like it says Abrahami Turkmen, the head of Iran's Islamic Culture and Communication Organization, and Ali Erbas, the head of Turkey's Religious Affairs Directorate, is meant to, quote, this new religious agreement is to, quote, to strengthen the unity of the Ummah. For those of you who may not know what the Umar is, it's simply the, the, the Islamic world. You got to understand something. Even though there, there are different Islamic countries, and right now there's only a few Islamic republics like Iran, like Saudi Arabia, under Islam, they believe in a worldwide caliphate. You mean, you mean something like a one world religion? That's exactly what I mean, by the way. But here's the thing. They've signed this uh, religious agreement last week, but the deal has come as a surprise to many since Turkey is a Sunni state and Iran is a Shia theocracy. Now, I don't want to go into a bunny trail, but I've been talking about this for a long time. I believe the ten toes of of Nebuchadnezzar's uh, statue in Daniel chapter 2, the iron and the clay mixture, I believe, and I've I've speculated and conjectured that that was a a Shia, uh, Shia Sunni coalition of the, of the beast kingdom and this article that just came out the other day is feeding into my speculation i will tell you that because uh turkey and iran these two countries have um throughout the throughout the years throughout the centuries they've been fierce adversaries during the times of the ottoman and persian empires they they were at odds with each other And this new initiative, this new religious initiative, has sparked concern among Muslims in Turkey who are critical of its potential repercussions in the teaching of Islam. And they started this hashtag, we are not Shia. So again, you see this this tension, which the which the book of Daniel talks about in chapter 2. There's this tension, there's this mixture, but they don't really mix together. It's 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 not a natural well, to some degrees it's a natural mixing, but it's 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 tenuous at best. But here's where I want to go with all this, because this guy, Seth Fransman, who is the executive director of the Middle East Center for Reporting and Analysis, said that this new uh, religious agreement between Persia and Iran, he said this, the new religious deal builds on economic cooperation between the two countries and their mutual interests. Again, bam, bang, boom. They're building upon what? They're economic cooperation what are the two main things that you read about in revelation 17 and 18 about the kingdom of the beast it's the spiritual unity it's the one world religion and it's the economic unity the one world currency oh you mean a one world currency in the kingdom of the beast or at least one they try to make a one world country uh, currency check this out Franzman said that in a meeting in Malaysia where both Iran and Turkey expressed interest in a new gold dina currency or dinar I guess that's I guess the proper pronunciation is dinar it's it's the Islamic currency in other words they were just talking about creating a new global Islamic currency the gold dinar and he goes on to say he goes on to say in this meeting that they had in, in uh, Malaysia, there is a growing consensus that Turkey and Iran have much in common in the region and globally. Now, I, 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 like I said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to really get into talking about the Mahadi in, in, a, in the next block. But I want you to understand what we're dealing with here. This is, this is what the media does not get. This is the elements that they choose to willfully ignore. That the Islamic world, and especially its leaders like the Ayatollah Khamenei and like Erdogan, and I've said this many, many times, they both want the same thing. They both think they're going to get it out of diff- from different perspectives, but because they want the same thing, they're willing to make uh, uh, agreements 
and they're, they're willing to, 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 to make compromises with each other in these areas of even this, this religious cooperation. This is huge, folks. This is something that's completely flown under the radar for the most part, except for those who are watching the Mideast and watching what's going on uh, this way in an eschatological mindset. Here's the thing before I get to my first break. Turkey and Iran, they are Sunni Shia, and they do have different views of where the Mahdi will come from. But both generally agree that it comes out of a time of great chaos. And hear me out on this. Iran is pushing for just such chaos. Here's the difference between Erdogan and and uh, who's part of the Muslim Brotherhood, who came out of the Muslim Brotherhood. But here's one of the biggest differences that's, that's kind of uh, fascinating to me. Erdogan is the three-piece suit, uh, kind of westernized, in a way, uh, Islamist. And the Ayatollah is, of course, this spiritual-garbed, false prophet kind of a guy. Right, in that, right there in itself, there's this, this interesting uh, picture of a political leader like Erdogan and a false prophet like like Ayatollah Khamenei. Now, I'm not saying that Erdogan is the Antichrist and the Ayatollah is the false prophet. I'm not saying that. I don't even believe that. I'm just saying, but there is a picture there. There is a picture there. There is, there, there is an analogy there of what we see in the Scripture between the, 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 the political leader who's the Antichrist and the false prophet who tells the world to follow after the Antichrist. And in the context here of, of this Islamist eschatology, even though there's a Sunni-Shia split, as I said a moment ago, they both agree that the Mahdi comes out from a time of great chaos, and Iran, as I said, is pushing for a time of chaos because they think, they believe, the Mahdi, the 12th Imam, they believe he comes out of a well. Yes, that's right. He comes out of a well that is in the mosque where just this past week they raised the red flag of Hussein above this mosque in the city of Qom. And I'm going to have more regarding that when I come back. Stick around, folks. I'll be right back. But understand this. In the midst of everything that's going on, and we dodged a missile this week, we all have one prayer. All of us have got one prayer. That's Jesus. I'll be right back. Stick around. I got my prayer. It's all I got. I just don't care. It's what I got. I got one prayer. That's all we got. Amen. Welcome back, Andy White. You are listening to Open Up the Doors here on Faith FM, WEGB 90.7 and 93.3 in that peak, and WEGQ 91.7 in Quag. And I am here penetrating the unseen powers of darkness by simply speaking the light of truth. And I can bet you my bottom dollar that I'm sending powers and principalities into frothy fits of frenzy just by showing up on the radio. <laughs> but yes, folks, I do want to get back to the topic at hand because I do have a lot. I've got a lot on my plate today. And I want to I want to talk a little bit about the idea of the Mahdi because a lot of people, I think, uh, don't really know about this aspect of Islam. Or, and, but I want to show you in a few minutes the correlation, the correlation between what Islam teaches is their Messiah the Mahdi, or the 12th Imam, and what our Bible t- says about the Antichrist, because the similarities are astounding. But before I get to that, let me just, I, at the end of the last block, the first block, I mentioned that uh, the Iranians raised the red flag of Hussein. You could also call it the red flag of the Mahdi if you wanted to. But on January 5th, the Islamic Republic of Iran raised the red flag of Hussein over the dome of a mosque in Qom. Now, by the way, let me mention here, there was a lot of reports out there from a lot of, uh, of credible sources, but they got it wrong. 
that's why I even posted it. But there was a lot of reports out there that it was the first time in history that this red flag had been unfurled and hoisted over this mosque. But that was misinformation. That wasn't true. It has been hoisted before on this mosque, but usually for uh, some of the high holy days in Islam. Um, This time it was hoisted because of a preparation and call to war. So the Western media is denying that that actually was the case, but you really dig into the weeds, it is the case. But let me let me get on with this. Written on the flag are the words in uh, in Aramaic, Yalla Thara Al Hussein, which is translated in English to O ye Avengers of Hussein. And it's it's recognized as a rallying call for all Muslims to call upon the return of the hidden Imam which is just another term for the Mahdi, the hidden imam, especially in, in, in Shia, in the Shia sect of Islam. They believed, they believed that their, their imam it was, is hidden away. So, so, so he's also got the moniker of being known as the hidden imam in the largest branch of Shia Islam. But this mosque where they raised this flag, is considered one of the most significant in Iran because it is believed that the long-awaited Mahdi will emerge from this mosque in the last days, according to Shia Islamic eschatology. So the raising of this flag was a very precise signal. It indicates that a major war is coming or is even now underway. It is the call to jihad. It is the call for the Mahdi to come and raise up the armies of Islam. Because this flag, folks, as much as the Western media might want to dismiss it and downplay it, this flag is steeped in religious symbolism relating to Islamic eschatology, their end time teachings, and the specter of total war of epic and religious proportions. It's a flag indicating that Iran is mobilizing its entire society towards a conflict never before seen. Bear in mind, this flag was never never raised even during the Iran Iraq War, because it it really is a it is really fair to call it the flag of the Mahdi. Now I think I want to say something here before I get too further down the road. I want to be really clear. I don't base my biblical eschatology whatsoever on Islamic eschatology. There are no prophets in Islam. Muhammad was not a prophet in the sense of foretelling. He was a false prophet for sure. But I do not whatsoever believe in Islamic prophecies, and I want to make that clear. They are pure counterfeits of the truth, and that's what makes it worth investigating because though you and I do not buy into their eschatology and though you and I do not buy into their religious beliefs, they do. And this is what the pundits and 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 and, and the political leaders in the West just don't seem to really get it. These people live their lives and everything they do And I'm talking about the Ayatollahs. I'm talking about the religious leaders of of, of Islam. They, They live their faith. They do. Christians ought to live their faith to the degree and level that Muslims do. But that's another story for another day. Let me not go down too much of a bunny trail. But for those who are not familiar with what Shia Muslims believe about the Mahdi, let me encapsulate it. Uh, really briefly, because, and listen, there, there is no way I can go for a verse-by-verse exhaustive analogy of these things. I'm just going to lay out a list of what they believe, and, 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 and you, can, you can do your homework. I advise you to do your, do your homework. I'm going to share nothing with you but absolute truth. You can look it up. But in Arabic, al-Mahadi means basically the guided one. And he is also sometimes referred to by Shia Muslims as Sahib al-Zaman or al-Mahdi al Mandadatha, which I, I just messed up that last word. I'll, I'll say it in English. He is referred to by Shia Muslims as the Lord of the Age. Now, for all of you who think that Muslims won't bow down to an antichrist and saying he's God, you need to really, re- we've, been, we've, been, we've just been given a whole lot of misinformation. 
But he's called, the Mahdi is called the Lord of the age and the awaited Savior in Islam. Muslims in general believe that a series of imams were appointed to carry on Muhammad's message and that these imams rank above all the other prophets except for Muhammad himself. And the twelfth imam, whose name was, or is, depending on your, your, your well, to, to, again, I'm referencing this in accordance to what Muslims believe, not what I believe. But the twelfth imam, whose, his, his name is Muhammad al-Mahdi, he is believed by Shiites to have been born in present-day Iraq in 869 and never to have died, and he's only gone into hiding. That's why they call him the hidden imam. And once again, we ought to notice how Satan counterfeits the word of God. In our Bible, we have Enoch and Elijah who never died, but they're not in hiding. God took them to heaven. And we also know that God is going to send Elijah back before the coming of Jesus. I believe is one of those two witnesses that we read about in the book of Revelation. I happen to believe personally, as an aside, that two witnesses in the book of Revelation are Enoch and Elijah, but that's a teaching for another day. But remember the Ayatollahs in Iran, they are believers, they are Twelvers, as I said ago. And they believe that al-Mahdi will return as a Messiah with another prophet, whom they believe is Jesus. They believe that Jesus is going to come back with the Mahdi to teach the Christian world that, that Muhammad was really the truth. This is what they believe. And that, that the Mahdi and that Isa, Jesus, is going to bring peace to the world and establish Islam as the ruling faith across the globe. So once again, we see this demonic corruption of the truth and a deception. But I want to look at a list of the comparisons between the Islamic Mahdi and what the Word of God says about the Antichrist. For instance, both the Mahdi and the Antichrist will lead a one-world government. Both the Mahdi and the Antichrist will lead a one-world religion, Islam. Both the Mahdi and the Antichrist will enter into a seven-year treaty with Jews and Gentiles. Yes, folks. Yes, 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 yes. Islam teaches that the Mahdi will uh, enter into a treaty with Israel and that he will rule the Mahdi by Islamic eschatology will rule for seven years and then be killed seven or eight years but again we see this overlapping between the truth and the counterfeit according to the Islamic scholars the Mahdi arrives riding upon a white horse he's called the white horsed rider but here's what's really crazy about this you know where they get that from Muslim scholars actually point to our Bible to show that the Mahdi comes on a white horse. But you know what verse they point to? The verse in Revelation 6, 2. Not the verse in Revelation 19 where it's Jesus is returning, but they point to the, to the book of Revelation in chapter 6, 2 where it says, And I saw and behold a white horse. He that sat on him went forth conquering and to conquer they apply that verse which we know to be the antichrist he is the first horseman of the apocalypse and we know as christians that this verse is describing the beginning of the tribulation they apply that verse to their mahadi that's astounding let me continue for a few more minutes here again i'm just making these very basic delineations of the comparisons. I can't. I don't have the time to get into all of the the Bible verses and the and the and the Hadith verses. I don't have the time to do that. But these are all facts according to uh, to Islamic teaching. The Mahdi invades and conquers Israel, and he rules from Jerusalem. Well, gee, that sounds a whole like, a whole lot like what the Bible says about the Antichrist, does it not? The Mahdi, according to Islam, targets Christians and Jews who do not convert to Islam. You will worship the beast or you will be headed. The Mahdi seeks to change laws and calendars. According to Islamic caliphate, you must live under Sharia law and under the Islamic 
calendar. Only religion in the world to do, to do that. The Jews have their own calendar, but they don't force it on anybody. The Christians have their own calendar. Most of the Western world follows the Christian calendar, which is 2020, but, but China doesn't. It's the year 5,000, 6,000, whatever. Muslims don't follow it. But the Mahdi will seek to change laws and times. Just like the little horn of Daniel chapter 7, verse 25, when Daniel says, The little horn shall persecute the saints of the Most High and shall intend to change times and law. The Mahdi will be assisted, as I said a moment ago, by a false prophet. Now, they consider that his assistant to be Jesus. Of course, our New Testament shows us that the beast out in Revelation also has a false prophet by his side, as I again alluded to a moment ago. Another comparison here that is taught in Islam, that the Mahdi will be granted supernatural powers from Allah to create miracles and other wonders. But our Bible tells us that the, that the coming of the lawless one is with all signs and wonders by the power of Satan. Again, by no means do I believe Allah is real. I'm just showing the comparison on this point, to who the Mahdi is said to have received his powers from and who the Antichrist receives them from. Throughout the Islamic world, throughout the Islamic world, there is a call for the restoration of the Islamic Caliphate. I've been talking about this on this broadcast for five years now. It is important to understand that when Muslims call for the restoration of the Caliphate, It is ultimately the Mahdi that they're calling for. For the Mahdi is the awaited final caliph of Islam. And Muslims everywhere will be obligated to follow the Mahdi. The Muslims in Europe will give their allegiance to the Mahdi. The Muslims in Malaysia will give their allegiance to the Mahdi. The Muslims in India and Canada and America will give their allegiance to the Mahdi if they're true Muslims because that is what they are commanded to do. One of the Muslim imams said this, I'll quote him, speaking of the Mahdi, quote, if you see him, go and give him your allegiance, even if you have to crawl over ice because he is the vice regent, the Khalifa of Allah. He is the vice regent of Allah. Oh, really? That, that's what the Catholics believe about the Pope, by the way. But I digress. He is the vice regent of Allah, the Mahdi. And he will pave the way for and establish the government of the family of Muhammad. Every believer is obligated to support the Mahdi. And folks, I want to tell you, they believe that the future of this world belongs to Islam and the Mahdi and that he will rule over not just the Islamic world but the non-Muslim world as well and the Shia mullahs of Iran along with the rest of the Muslim world believes that the Mahdi will arrive on the scene during a time of great turmoil and chaos caused by war and natural disasters and religious apostasy. This is the counterfeit religion of the Antichrist. This is what these people, this is what their ideology is, and this is what is uh, animating them to do the things that they do. So though I do agree and say yes, things have simmered down for the moment. Trust me when I tell you, my friends, it's only for the moment. But thank God that the true Messiah and the true Savior of the world is coming. The Lion of the tribe of Judah is coming back. Hallelujah. And my eyes continually look toward that day. I'll be back in a moment, folks. Stick around. Here's Jason Upton, the Lion of Judah. The 
fusion of heart, mind, soul. This is Open Up the Doors with Andy White here on Faith FM. WEGB 90.7, 93.3 in that peak. WEGQ 91.7 in Quag. Hey, welcome back, everybody. Thanks for joining in with me on this week's edition of Open Up the Doors. Hey, if you would like to, if you're just joining in, if you're joining in late, I am streaming live over on my Open Up the Doors Facebook page over at facebook.com slash faithfm91.7. If you've never liked the page, please like the page. And for those of you who are on Facebook, please share this into your streams and let people know about the broadcasts. All right, is there anything else I want to get to before I get back to my final thoughts of the day? Yes, there is. My YouTube channel. Please, if you never, ever, ever have subscribed to my YouTube channel, please go on over to YouTube. Just search for Andy White, open up the doors, and you will uh, find my page, and you can subscribe. I plan on, I'm thinking about doing a YouTube supplement to this broadcast tomorrow night. At about seven seven thirty. Uh, so if you want to tune in on YouTube tomorrow night, you'll get a notification if you have subscribed. There's a little bell there when you subscribe to the YouTube channel. There's a little bell there. Just click on that bell so you'll get notifications that when I do go to YouTube Live, you'll you'll know it and you'll see it. But uh, again, uh, I hope to go on YouTube Live. Planning on it unless something else comes up. But I'm planning on going on YouTube Live tomorrow at seven p.m. Well, let me see. What else do I need to get to before I get to what I got to get to here? All right. I'm ready to go. <laughs> I got some. I said in the uh, I got some closing thoughts, but I said in the I've been saying it a couple of times throughout this broadcast that. These. Apocalyptic ideologues. In Iran, especially. They want to create chaos. They do believe that out of chaos, their imam, their mahadi will arise. And they're, they're a very different breed of, no, I shouldn't say very different, but there is that difference. A guy like Erdogan, he believes in, in bringing it about through, through the political system, through the political structures. That's why you see Erdogan doing the things that he does. And the guy, Erdogan's a fox, man. People, people have been underestimating him for years. But he's a fox with a plan. And, he's, and, and, and it's, it's not so much that Erdogan wants to create chaos. No, he's going to leave that for the for the Ayatollahs to do over there in Iran. See, these are the ones that, this is where the difference between Sunni and Shia really plays out. But the bottom line is this. Make no mistake, excuse me, make no mistake about it. There is a coming chaos. Now, as I see this past week, I got to get something off my chest here because it's been infuriating me. When I've been watching the various news channels, especially the mainstream, lamestream media, the leftist propaganda, and that's what they are. The leftist propaganda, American news media, folks, they have made themselves enemies of the American people. And no, I'm not channeling Donald Trump here. These people have become the mouthpiece of evil. And if you think that is hyperbolic on my part, you really don't understand the situation of the ideology that we are dealing with. It's been aggravating and infuriating to me to see uh, how these people have sided with the enemies of America, from the congressional Democrats all the way down to the, to the leftist media mob. For the most part, almost all of the media pundits and even those on the conservative side do not understand a major piece of the equation regarding the Iranians and the Islamic eschatological beliefs in general, as I said at the top of the show. And I hear all of these different commentators and pundits saying Iran's not going to do this, or they're not going to do that because they know they'll be obliterated. I heard one pundit the other day say they may be evil, but they're not stupid. Well, there's a fine line between evil and stupidity. And their apocalyptic beliefs will lead them into acting out in a very evil and stupid way. You can rest, you can take that to the bank. And when you listen to these folks on TV, my friends, 
when you listen to these folks on TV, you need to understand that for the most part, these people, they're looking at things in a completely conventional wisdom mindset. And they are thinking in a politically pragmatic sort of way. But you cannot deal that way with the Iranians. Not the ruling mullahs anyway. Not the ones who are in control. They have this, again, I'll say it, this apocalyptic worldview. And they will act out against all common sense. They will prod and poke and agitate and foment against all common sense. Because though we in the West may dismiss their theocratic and apocalyptic belief system, they live according to it. They want to create chaos. The National Review just this past week said this in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a column, in an article they wrote, Iran is capable of spreading chaos across the Middle East. Its assets include Hezbollah, Syrian-based militias that work for the Assad regime in Iran, and more than 100,000 members of pro-Iranian Shiite militias in Iraq. Iran has also transferred advanced missiles and drones to the Houthi rebels in Yemen. In addition, the Shiite militias in Iraq, called the Popular Mobilization Units, have received ballistic missiles from Iran in August 28 and in 29. And yes, my friends, despite how the, the American left and the pundits want to dismiss it, it was paid for with funds that Barack Obama sent to them. $1.3 billion in cash on pallets. And when they try and tell you, well, that was the Iranians' money anyway, no, it was not. And I don't have time to get into all of that. But that's how they're trying to diffuse that, that little point of fact. We had $400 million uh, uh, in, in Iranian assets frozen. And it was frozen because... Uh, 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 of the, uh, it really belonged to the Shah. And it was frozen during the Iranian Revolution in seventy nine. The rest of the money was calculated to be the uh, the uh, interest on the four hundred million. But the Obama administration—I said I didn't have time to get into this, so I really don't. But the Obama administration refused to give Congress and the congressional oversight the the uh, the calculus for how they came up with that uh, figure in in in, de in deducting the interest. Besides that, that almost doesn't matter because we had counterclaims against the money, and the the the, the, the it was supposed to be settled in the uh, the World Bank court in the UN and like any court cases there is no determination until the case is run so when the Democrats tell you it was their money anyway no it was not there was counterclaims American counterclaims that were legitimate that that had to be uh, litigated in a court of law finally I'll say this before I completely run out of time anytime you send you you take pallets of cash the only people that deal in cash, my friends, are the mob and, and syndicated crime. When you start dealing in billions of dollars of cash, there is nothing legal about that whatsoever. And I am totally, uh, totally in, infuriated with the way uh, they try to run cover and run interference for Barack Obama. And I went down a road I really didn't have time to run down. But it's, it's just I can't stand the lies anymore. I just can't stand the lies anymore. As I've stated, folks, at the beginning of the top of the show, I heard a lot of folks saying, no, 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 this isn't the start of World War III or the other extreme. Oh, yes, it's the start of World War III. But I think that the downplaying or the overplaying or being a little bit too dismissive of what's going on over there, needs, we need to be careful with that. I understand on the one hand you don't want to engage in fear-mongering. I get that. And that's nothing I want to engage in as well. But on the other hand, there is a very real danger of underestimating a very real place where all this could go. And here's the bottom line in the last minute or two that I have. Sobriety. Sobriety. Not complacency is the need of the hour. And though I know we all probably sighed a collective sigh of relief on Wednesday when we heard President Trump say the Iranians are appearing to stand down. Hey, listen, 
I've been predicting the outbreak of World War III. I've been predicting that, that America is going to be hit by complete surprise. That doesn't mean I want to see it happen. I'm just telling you what I'm feeling and seeing and sharing with you that I believe will happen. It doesn't mean I want it to happen. When I, when I heard the news Tuesday night, I was at a Bible study. And when I heard the news about what was going on with the, with the Iranians sh- uh, shooting their missiles at our bases, after the Bible study was over, I immediately went home. I never do that. I usually hang out with Pastor Tom and, and Denise for a little bit, and we chill out after the Bible study. I just grabbed my jacket, and I went home because I really I didn't know what was going to happen. I didn't know if we were going to immediately immediately pounce on Iran and then cause China and, 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 and Russia to get to get involved. I just wanted to get home. I just wanted to get home because if, if all hell broke loose, sorry for my French here on Christian radio, but if all he- it's going, it's going to be from hell. We know that Satan has been cast down to the earth, but I got it close. In any case, we may have dodged a bullet or should I say a missile this week regarding the outbreak of world war three. But I guarantee you, my friends, that the chaos is still coming. And I urge you to be in prayer. And I urge you to walk with sobriety and walk in humility in all the things that are going on in the world around us. I got to run. I'll be back next week. God bless you all.